for inviting me to speak here, and thank you for the courtesy and generosity with which I've been greeted by the Asian Art Museum of San Francisco. It's, it's been a lovely trip. I appreciate it. Um, so our topic today is the Bodhisattva Avalokiteshvara, who is the embodiment of the virtue of compassion. And as you all know, compassion and a kind of spiritual wisdom or knowledge are the two primary virtues in Buddhism. Um, and this makes this an enormous topic, huge, gargantuan, almost unmanageable. Um, and so I thought a lot about how to do this. And I made a couple of executive decisions. One is that while I am aware, as you are, that Avalokiteshvara has many names, sort of a, a basic name for each country in which it was worshipped, and that's essentially all of Buddhist Asia. Um, I gave you a few, Chinese, Korean, Japanese, Tibetan. I decided not to necessarily um, use all those names. I've decided for, for the purposes of this lecture that what I'm going to do is, is refer to our bodhisattva as Ava. I would like to absolutely stress to all of you that I have spent my life studying Buddhist traditions and that I am profoundly respectful of them. And I am not, it, my intent is in no way, shape, or form to be disrespectful or for those of you that are practitioners to, to make a joke of, of, out of what is maybe a very serious religious commitment. I'm just trying to talk for two hours without having my tongue twist too much. The other thing I decided to do, because we could look at Avalokiteshvara chronologically or geographically, is to do something that's vaguely chronological um, in which we jump around Asia quite a bit. And one of the reasons for that is that art history is always the study of what was preserved, not necessarily the study of what was made. And it's easier in this context for me to kind of move around between cultures. So if you would be so kind as to close your eyes and get your map of Asia firmly into your head, and I assumed in this time, in this place, that was not asking a lot of the audience, then we'll just jump around. I'm also um, giving broad dates rather than specific ones. And finally, I decided to concentrate on the collection of the Asian Art Museum of San Francisco. So as you're looking at the slides, you'll see little blue stars in the upper right-hand corners. That's your piece. That was, again, a way to try to keep a story going for two hours without having to say, and that's here, and that's here, and that's here. The little blue stars are not exactly all the same size. This was not something that was intended to convey any information whatsoever. This was the person who made the PowerPoint being in a rush and getting lazy, <laughs> not getting them all to match. So I apologize, but that's why they're different sizes. So moving right along, I think a good place to start since Avalokiteshvara, from now on Ava, is a bodhisattva, is to talk about what a bodhisattva is and how that term evolved in the literature and in the visual arts. Um, as you all know, Buddhism was founded by a man who was born in the 6th century BC, but we have very, very little evidence in the visual sense for Buddhist practice until the 1st century AD. At that point in time, the term bodhisattva is essentially used specifically for the historical Buddha, Shakyamuni, born Siddhartha Gautama, and it means a being who is on the path to enlightenment, so someone who is trying to become a Buddha. So in the early texts, Siddhartha Shakyamuni is referred to as the Bodhisattva. And as you all know, in his life story, he lived multiple lifetimes. So when he became the Buddha, he had been practicing or moving his way through time and space and reborn over and over again. And becoming the Buddha meant that this was his final lifetime in physical form and he would transcend all mortal concerns. The earliest representations of Buddha from India are represented by the two pieces, uh, the two slides that you can see. And they, they encapsulate this problem we have with terminology going forward. So as you can see, both of these figures are the types of figures that are called Buddha 
in art history. They both have perfected bodies with um, you know, the powerful torsos and long legs and the sort of snail shell curls and the elongated earlobes. They both have attendants. They both have halos, which are mark of spirituality around the world. They have lions on their thrones or, in one case, a wheel on their thrones. So if you look at it and if you're comfortable looking at Buddhist art, your first thought is that is a Buddha. And if you read an art history book about Indian art, they will tell you that is a Buddha. But in both cases, the inscriptions on the bases tell you that this is the Bodhisattva. And that's because the line between Buddha and Bodhisattva was really a little amorphous initially. And, and that's why reading this stuff can make you nuts, because it seems like the meaning of Bodhisattva changed. And the answer is that it did. But initially, it really is a reference to the historical Buddha Shakyamuni. And these early references, which are centuries after the life of the historical Buddha, these early ones are basically found, oh, hmm, there we go, uh, in one area in India, which is called Machura, and is one of the great early s uh, periods for sculpture. And then sort of a couple of centuries later, like third to fourth century, you have a major flourishing of Buddhist practice in art in a place called Gandhara, um, which is all, as you all probably know, was actually, the, it's the name of an area in Pakistan, it's the Roman name for a specific area in Pakistan, and it's in the Gandharan material that we start to find, see these are yours, little stars, stars don't match, got it? Oh. <laughs> I just couldn't do it, I didn't have the patience that night. Um, so the, you, we start to find a very clear distinction visually between a being that is a Buddha and a being that is a Bodhisattva. Um, both of them are wearing Indic clothing. So essentially what they've got is a sarong-like garment and then a large shawl around the shoulders. In the case of the Buddha, the shawl covers both shoulders. In the case of the Bodhisattva, it's very erratically worn. Um, there are di both have halos, so both are sacred. There are differences in the hairstyles. This is a very Hellenized hairstyle, which is hiding one of the symbols or marks of a Buddha, which is this cranial protuberance called a nushnisha at the top of the head. Um, this is a sort of lay hairstyle, very elaborate shinyo or tifan. Um, the big difference between the Buddhas and the bodhisattvas is that the bodhisattvas wear jewelry. Right? So the bodhisattva is understood to still be part of the phenomenal world. The Buddha, who has now taken the guise of an Indian monk, is understood to have transcended mortal concerns. And this is an area where there's a lot of argument. Because the issue is whether or not the bodhisattvas are generic or if they're a specific being. And by this point in time, you've still got the historical Buddha, a historical figure, but you've got other bodhisattvas that are more celestial in being. Most, um, many scholars would argue because this bodhisattva is holding a flask, this is Maitreya, which I forgot to give you on your list, so it's M-A-I-T-R-E-Y-A. -E and Maitreya is a very interesting figure in Buddhism. He's a bodhisattva right now. He is someone who is working his way towards enlightenment in a future lifetime. After the world destroys itself, I'm not making a political statement. <laughs> I can't say this with a straight face anymore. <laughs> After the world destroys itself, it will be recreated. We will need another teaching Buddha. We will need someone to bring the religion back to us, and that is Maitreya. So like Siddhartha, he's a bodhisattva in prior lifetimes, which happens to be now also for him, and in the future he will be a Buddha. Somewhere along the line, the notion of bodhisattva changed. And while it's still, any practitioner is still trying to become a Buddha, as Buddhism evolved and became more and more complicated, the notion that there were these celestial savior guide beings out in the cosmos to whom one could offer devotion and who could guide and help one to achieve enlightenment, its so goal is always to become a Buddha, evolved and you started getting celestial Buddhas. And that is when our friend Ava 
becomes a major figure in Buddhist thought. So you're still looking at a bodhisattva, still wearing Indian clothing, still has a halo, still has jewelry, uh, may or may not be holding a lotus here. There's a lot of argument about what that is. And distinguished from the other bodhisattvas by the fact that there's a little Buddha in his headdress. And that Buddha is a specific celestial Buddha. His name in Sanskrit is Amitabha. So Shakyamuni is a historical figure who's become a Buddha. Amitabha is a celestial or transcendent Buddha who's there to, uh, as a form of devotion. And the reason that Avalokitesha has the Buddha in his headdress is because as Buddhism becomes more and more complicated, and it does, Buddhas, there, there's a notion that there are families and Amitabha is the head of Ava's spiritual lineage. So that's what he's doing there. There is a lot of, this is actually a fairly good sized sculpture, I think it's like four feet tall. It's a rare image to find in Gandharan art. And there is a lot of controversy about whether this was an independent icon. So this was a deity that was the focus of worship or whether the few sculptures that we find from Gandhara that have the Amitabha Buddha in their headdress are, were once initially part of triad. So you would have a Buddha in the center and then two bodhisattvas attending them. As I told you before, art history is what was found, not what was made. Um, but it's kind of pretty clear that at least the notion of Avalokiteshvara and Ava with a headdress, a Buddha in his headdress, was very much around by the third or the fourth century. As we move from the fourth to the fifth and the sixth century, we really begin to see the flourishing of the cult of this bodhisattva. And I'm showing you now one of the most famous cave temple sites in India, one I suspect many of you have visited. It's called a Janta. Just to remind you, those of you that may not think about this all day long every day, like me, um, this, is, this is what's called a cave temple. So it's a man-made structure that has been built into the side of a mountain. Cave temples are monastic complexes. In addition to the cave temples, most of them had some kind of wooden architecture which has disappeared. In a cave temple, you will find cells for monks. You'll find dor you know, dormitories, dining areas, places for meditation, and a certain number of caves that were clearly devotional and have elaborate imagery in them. This particular cave at Ajanta, basically, as, as you walk into the cave, has a Buddha, primary Buddha, probably Shakyamuni, as a teaching figure, and as is true of cave temples generally, is embellished with both sculpture and painting. And the painting on our left-hand side at the moment is probably one of the most famous depictions of Ava in early Indian art. It has been called the beautiful bodhisattva. Um, it dates to the late fifth century. And as you can see, the bejeweled and um, beautifully dressed bodhisattva is larger than all of the other figures, but he's clearly in some kind of a world that includes actual figures and this sort of music making half man, half bird thing up here. So it's kind of somewhere between the, the celestial and the mundane world. It's, he's kind of in this interstitial space. Um, people argue about whether this is our friend Abba or not because there's no Amitabha in the headdress, but he is holding a lotus. And one of the names for Ava throughout Asia is the lotus holder. And this is a reference to the notion that even something as simple as the gesture of offering a lotus to another human being can help spur enlightenment Indian scholars, because there's no Amitabha, are less comfortable saying specifically that this is an Ava. Sometimes they want to call it a lotus bearer or a Padmapani. I think, now we're going to change cultures, that in fact the Chinese evidence makes it absolutely clear that this was intended as an Ava. And that's because in China, in the sort of 470s, you find a lot of small devotional figures such as this where you've got a bodhisattva, Chinese bodhisattva, wearing Indi Indic clothing and Indic jewelry, holding a lotus, 
standing before a halo, surrounded by flames, and because China is one of the world's great history writing cultures, this particular piece has an inscription on it telling you who the donor was, giving you a date, and then saying specifically that it's Abba. So if the notion was that well developed that it's flo floating around in China in the late fifth century, I would argue that we're comfortable with our Ajanta Bodhisattva also being a representation of Ava. And in China at this time, you find this repeatedly. So this is my bad picture of the caves at Bingling Se. Um, and in one of those caves, you find a triad. So you've basically got your Buddha and two attendant bodhisattvas. I should have put this on the other. This is this guy here. He's clearly holding a tiny lotus. And there's an inscription here, again, also saying that this lotus-bearing bodhisattva is Ava. So I think we can say that by the late fifth century, the cult of Ava as a um, independent deity has really evolved and is was well known. And when you look at China throughout the sixth century, it becomes clearer and clearer that Ava is the, the um, center of a major cult, that he's an extremely important figure, and that he is independent deity who's the focus of worship. So you find excavated altar pieces or excavated pieces, again inscribed, again telling you that this is absolutely Ava. In this case, Ava is the primary icon in this altar piece. He's attended by four other bodhisattvas, two of whom are holding lotuses, just in case we're getting confused. There are four monks, guardian figures, and music-making angels surrounding it. And so you have a very clear visual interpretation of devotion to this figure and the understanding that within the evolving and vast Buddhist pantheon, he is a significant devotional figure. Um, China is also in China. You also find at this time the development of large-scale figures of that I would uh, argue are as also this bodhisattva. So this, this is a very well-known site in Shanxi province, and this is a Japanese archival photograph from the 1930s. You can see the powerful standing bodhisattva on the cliffside. Um, I was there 10 years ago. This is what it looks like now. Right? So it's, it's, had a, it's had a tough life. Um, but you can see that there, was, that, that there was some kind of major imagery going on here with a bodhisattva as the central deity and lots of attendant Buddhas. And although this is an obscure site and very hard to reach, so there's, not a, there's nothing really left. Back down here you can see remnants of what were probably stone and wood buildings. So it was a major monastery at this time. But we find in Western collections a large number of these very, very 10 foot tall powerful depictions of Ava. This one happens to be at the map, which means Denise has spent a lot of time looking at it. Um, and I would argue that these are Ava too. And my reason for that is pretty complicated. So basically you've got a bodhisattva, in this case not necessarily with an Amitabha in the headdress, but wearing what starts to be a major um, attribute to bodhisattvas in China at this point in time, which is truly a harness of jewels. It's not a necklace. A necklace is like what I'm wearing, right? It would just be up here. It's, it, it ties at the back, it very clearly ties at the back, and it goes all the way down the body. This is something that starts being shown in East Asian Buddhas, Buddhism at this point in time for bodhisattvas. And if you want to, you can deconstruct the elements in this harness of jewels and discover that some are Chinese or some are Central Asian in their sources, but you have large numbers of these big, fantastic, bejeweled bodhisattvas. We also have evidence that in the Northern Qi, my, still my, one of my favorite periods, um, there was among the ruling elite at the time a great deal of devotion to Ava. The Northern Qi commissioned specific Buddhist texts known as sutras Worshipping Ava, there was a great deal of interest in the Lotus Sutra, which has a chapter dedicated to our friend Ava. And one of the stories in the Lotus Sutra is that of how another bodhisattva, Akshamati, if you want to know, was so impressed by the depth of Ava's compassion 
for the entire human race that he offered Ava this elaborate, beautiful necklace to thank him for his compassion for the world. And I have suggested, and not everyone agrees with me, that that's why this kind of jewelry starts showing up. And that's why I think we can argue that initially, when you see this harness of jewels, you are looking at Ava and not another bodhisattva, and Ava specifically as a primary devotional deity. So this is um, a piece from Boston, and you all know where this one's from now, right? right? And you can see that we've got the elaborate jewelry in both cases. Um, the one in Boston has both the Amitabha in the headdress and the lotus, and is holding what might be a piece of cloth. Uh, I have to go look in the gallery, unless you guys happen to know off the top of your head. But essentially, I would argue that these are both independent icons illustrating devotion to Ava in China in the late 6th and early 7th century. Um, the interesting thing you might notice is that Ava is now beginning to carry a flask. That's another one of these things where Buddhism evolved and changed. So initially, when you see this kind of a flask, you are looking at the Bodhisattva Maitreya, but by the 6th century, it's also become a symbol of Avalokiteshvara, and you see it over and over again. So we have Avalokiteshvara, sometimes with the Amida, Amitabha, sometimes without, but often holding the flask that becomes one of his attributes or primary symbols. Okay, so now we've gone back to India, but we're still in the late 6th century, and we're at a cave site called Aurangaban, and you can see that this idea of the Bodhisattva, and specifically the Bodhisattva Ava, as a colossal figure, is also appearing in Indian visual arts at around the same time as this, maybe slightly later. Um, in this case, these figures, I gave you the sketch because it's easier to read, are basically devotional figures excuse me, protective figures. So they're not actually in the caves, they're in the verandas that are right before the caves. If you look at the one on your left, you'll see that Ava is attended by two Buddhas. So clearly it's achieved, he, she, has achieved a certain status. Um, that he, that there is the little Buddha in the headdress, that the hair is very long and matted, that the lotus is there, and that there are little vignettes on the sides where the Bodhisattva reappears over and over again in some kind of a story. This is a specific type of Ava. Here's the real thing. Um, it's Ava as the savior from perils. This is also something that's based on the Lotus Sutra that seems to have been an important text throughout Asia at that time. Um, and essentially what this story is, is that there are these um, often very mundane human things like being attacked by tigers while you're traveling or getting sick or something like that. And this powerful Ava can save you from all of those problems. This was a form of the Bodhisattva that was very, very important to travelers and merchants. It shows up in India at this point in time. Um, and, oops, and also in China, I'll show you that in a minute. But it's, it's this Ava as a physically active being who's a protector in the mundane world, which is probably why this Bodhisattva later became so popular throughout Asia. Um, the other, oops, I have, sorry. The other thing you need to know is that this is, this is matted hair, right? So this is basically a reference to ascetic practices, which seem to have been coming into Buddhism again at this point in time. So it's not well-coiffed hair. Matted hair in this context is always a little, it's a visual notion, so it's, it's hard for some of us to read. And again, there's virtually no jewelry, right? So this is a powerful practitioner not necessarily just someone who's, who's hanging around in the cosmos to help all of us. Um, and you see this kind of switch towards a more practice-oriented representation of Ava throughout Asia, very much from the 7th through the 10th century, but it's best recorded in Southeast Asia. And things get kind of complicated with the whole idea of Bodhisattva and Buddha and jewelry, because at this point in time, Buddhas also start wearing crowns and jewelry. So this is, this is a really fascinating piece in, uh, in Lakma, actually, which is sort of a typical Bodhisattva identified as an Ava because of the flask. And I don't know if you can see it from the audience, but can you see that there's actually an antelope skin over his shoulder? 
So that's a reference to the fact that this is someone who's out in the wilderness practicing and sort of wearing nice clothing, but also dressed in animal skins. In Southeast Asia, um, and this is from Thailand, this also becomes a very, very important representation of the Bodhisattva Avalokiteshvara. So you can see that not only, are, so this is again messy matted hair. This is someone who isn't combing his hair. And very little clothing or jewelry, just a tiny little short sarong that's, if you look very closely at it, and you can because this is yours, really tied with rope. So it's not even a belt, it's rope. The other thing that you'll see is all of a sudden our Bodhisattva has four arms. Very, very simply put, this is just another way of showing you the great powers, right? As a working mother, I can tell you that four arms would have been better than two. It's really, it's not a tough one. It's really just that basic. People sometimes go, oh, but why, why, why? And I'm like, power. It's about power. Um, so, okay. And this, this particular type of Avalokiteshvara really continues in the South and Southeast Asian tradition for centuries. It's, um, you can find both. You often find forearms, you often find six arms. By the time we're looking at the 6th to the 8th century, so no, I should say 8th to 10th century, which is on your left, and slightly 12th, 13th, which is on your right, the Amitabha in the headdress is pretty well established. You see it throughout Asia. And you also see this kind of interplay between this compassionate figure and the idea of power and compassion. So all of a sudden you start seeing lots and lots of arms. Four is common, two, six. As we get further into this lecture, you'll see more and more arms. In some cases, you're looking at clothing which seems to at least allude to a sort of very austere aesthetic practice. There is no jewelry, so there isn't always jewelry on bodhisattvas. And in some cases, there is jewelry and very elaborate belts. So the Khmer piece on your right has uh, a crown, it has a necklace, it has armlets, it has bracelets, it's wearing the sarong, but there's clearly an elaborate belt, and it's got anklets. It's a very, very elaborately dressed, powerful, almost probably semi-royal figure that's also still compassion and power, which is what we're going to see all the way through. And in fact, the same kind of changes in Buddhism, and, and these weren't like, you know, today is, today, Ava only has two arms tomorrow, it has four, right? These were very, very gradual changes in a religion which by this point in time was being practiced throughout the world. So everyone knew about it. Um, and it was constantly evolving, both internally by um, sort of responses to practitioners and what people needed, and also externally as different cultures, the Indic and the Sinitic, the Chinese and the Japanese, all began to sort of deal with this within their own regional spheres. So one of the things that starts happening with Avalokiteshvara is that he starts taking on multiple manifestations, or avatars, since that's become part of our culture. and, and it's important to realize that these are both different forms of a specific deity and still the core deity itself. So it's not like there, multi there are 33 types of ava. There's ava with 33 manifestations. And these manifestations are almost always making the bodhisattva both more powerful and in some ways more accessible. And on your worksheet, I've given you mostly the, almost, on, I have given you only the English language readings for these terms. Let me say before we get into this that in fact, of course, there are Sanskrit words, there are Chinese words, there are Japanese words, there are Tibetan words, there are Thai words. Um, it's, it, you, could, you can find them all online if you really want them. Um, you can drive yourself and any audience you have crazy. You can certainly drive people in a gallery talk mad by trying to say all these names, which is why, again, I've decided to say Ava. One of the first ones to appear also starts off in the cave temples at, in India, and this one is Kanari, and it's the 11-headed manifestation of Avalokiteshvara. So again, 
By this point, you're all easily spotting the lotuses, right? No problem. Um, and clearly, 11 heads. In this case, it's, a, a, it's an attendant bodhisattva. So it's both an independent deity that's on right and a bodhisattva that is part of a triad with a Buddha. And this particular manifestation, out of all of the ones that we'll be discussing in this lecture, um, is pro was probably the most prominent. So I've got you now at Dunhuang, and I know several of you have been there. That's probably the most famous cave temple site in the world. It's in northwest China in Gansu. And you can see that we're looking at a manifestation of the 11-headed bodhisattva. This is a rare painting from the 10th century where you don't find so many paintings in Asia. Clearly got the 11 heads. If you look very closely, although they're in this case six arms, he is holding a lotus. Um, but what's kind of fascinating is that this particular depiction of Avalokiteshvara with a, a monk who may have been responsible for the sort of iconography of the painting and the donor being shown as well is also the savior from perils. So that iconography that we saw in the Aurangabad caves where you had the tall colossal bodhisattva and the little vignettes all along the sides, has been incorporated. They've now made the 11-headed also the savior from perils. We're going to see a lot of this as we go through this talk. It happens over and over again. Um, if you get too hung up about putting each manifestation in its proper box, you will be mad by the end of this talk. So, so just assume that, that this is the, the, the embodiment of compassion in our world, and it will take multiple forms to help and guide all of us, depending on what we think it needs. The 11 headed spread throughout Asia very, very quickly. So this is a Chinese example, and this is a Japanese one. In this case, they're holding the flask again, and the lotus, which is very, very hard to see, but it is there. Um, and would have probably been there initially, although it seems to have disappeared. You've got the Amitabha in the headdress very clearly in this one, and then 11 heads. This one is a little harder to read. Um, both are major forms of this bodhisattva. This was the first sort of complicated manifestation that spread throughout Asia. Um, and I wanted to, I'm going to do the break a little early. Sorry, I didn't plan this properly. The, um, one of my favorites is actually in Korea, and as Jennifer mentioned, I got very interested in the Shilla Kingdom at one point in my career. So cave temples, which we've been looking at for evidence all the way through this talk, are found in India, they're found in Central Asia, and they're found in China. They do not occur in either Korea or Japan. This may just be a geographic thing. It may just have to do with whether or not you've got a certain type of stone that you can build. This, in Korea, in the 8th century, in the Shilla Kingdom, they actually made a fake cave temple. So this is called the Sukaram. And when you visit it today, there's this sort of visitor center you enter. The actual site itself is sort of a mound. It's, it's a sort of domed stone chamber which is back here and which has been covered with earth. And when you look at it very, very carefully, you, uh, or when you go inside, what you'll see is a central Buddha seated in the middle of the hall. Again, it's a colossal Buddha, arguments about which one it is, um, surrounded by the Buddha's disciples that are carved all along this circular form. And then right behind this Buddha is our good friend, the 11-headed version of the Bodhisattva Ava, attesting to its importance in the 8th century. 